So in the previous lecture, we had ended with uh, uh, this, uh, the impulse response for a continuous time system. And we basically wanted to utilize the discrete time. Uh, so, so we had, we knew what the response of a system in a discrete time LTI system is going to be uh, using the convolution. And we wanted to leverage that for understanding the response to the system in continuous time. Uh, in order to facilitate this, uh, this understanding, what we did was we first discretized the signal. Uh, so we had the signal XT, which is a continuous time signal. And what we did was we created blocks of length delta. And the delta function that we had was one over delta for time zero less than equal to T less than equal to delta and it's zero otherwise. And then we, uh, so with this delta function, we constructed this signal x hat t, which is sort of a uh, approximation to the original signal x t, which can be written in this fashion. And delta is a small number. And so as delta goes to zero, this approximation x hat delta t converges to x t. And you can clearly see that in this picture, where x hat t is this upper envelope of these square blocks, or oh, sorry, these rectangular blocks that I've made in gray and uh, xt is the line in black. So x hat t converges to xt for all t. And then we could, uh, yeah, then we could write x of t as an integral of uh, x tau and delta t minus tau. Uh, and this, this thing comes from the Riemann integration, the, to the topic of Riemann integration, which where as you take delta goes to zero, xt becomes sort of an integral. Uh, this is also the sampling property of delta, so of uh, impulse function. So we are just using both the things uh, in this particular equation. Now the question is when you give the input to an LTI system as input xt, uh, given that now xt can be written as a limit of uh, this x hat delta t, then uh, what would the output is what would the output look like and so in order to compute that what we did was we we inputted the system with x hat t which is an approximation of x t and what we do what we did was we let delta go to zero so with input x hat delta t we our output is going to be y hat delta t as i let delta go to zero my output y of t would converge to sorry the output y hat t would converge to y of t Okay, so how do we do that? Well, let me just uh, go over this whole expression right now to so my x hat of t, which is equal to summation This is the input. Now, let's say my output is h hat delta t. Okay, so the output towards, so if you, if you input the signal delta, capital delta t, the output is going to be h hat delta t. Now this is an LTI system. So if I give it an input, k delta by the property of the LTI system, the output is going to be h hat k delta. And I know that as delta goes to zero, h hat delta t converges to h of t, which is the impulse response of this system, of this LTI system. Okay, so now I multiply it by x of k delta.
Okay, so we have this uh, sequence of steps. This is the exact step that we had taken even for the discrete time case. So I'm just sort of mimicking the same step for the continuous time case. So I give it an input, um, this impulse input. I get this approximated impulse output. And I know that as delta goes to zero, the impulse output is going to converge to the impulse output of the original system. Then I give it this approximate uh, impulse, which is translated in time, so translated by k delta. I get the same because it's an LTI system, it's a time invariant system, therefore the output is going to be h hat t minus k delta. And as I let k delta go to tau and delta goes to zero, I'll have this particular term converse to h of t minus tau. Now I, I'm going to multiply it by x of k delta on this side. I'm going to scale the input. And so my output is also going to get scaled by the same quantity. And next comes, I'm going to give it an input. K goes to minus infinity to plus infinity x of Oh, I should probably add delta here. T minus K delta, delta. This goes through the LTI system. And I have the same minus infinity to infinity. Okay, so this is the superposition principle. Okay, these two things requires linearity. This thing requires time invariance. Ti part, this is the L part. And now our goal is to take this limit. Delta goes to zero, K delta goes to tau. And then this summation will turn into an integral. Okay, so any questions so far? Um, for that, uh, those those two, uh, that L and T up there, what are those for? On the very far left. On the very, this one? Where you have your brackets on the left. That's the right. Left, oh, this one? This yes. one? What, what is, yeah. What are those for? Time invariance. So this, here I'm using the time invariance part of TI. TI is time invariance. Okay. So remember, this is an LTI system, right? So this is the time right. invariance part. This is the L part, the linear linear part of the system. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking this question. So together, this is an, uh, we are using all the properties of LTI system in order to get to this final expression. And now, uh, we are going to do the usual stuff. I'm going to let delta go to zero. And of course, k delta would be replaced with tau. And um, and this y hat delta t, this would converge to integral of x tau h hat t minus tau d tau. And this integral is going from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, and this is exactly, this is yt, which is x convolution h of t. This is the convolution in continuous time. Okay, so in discrete time, we had this convolution with summation. In continuous time, we have this convolution with integral. But the expressions are exactly the same for the convolution.
Any questions so far? Is it obvious how we got this integral expression from the summation? This is our Riemann integral. For uh, giggles, why don't you explain it? So, I mean, this is this is how. So, let's say you want to discretize. You want to come up with the uh, discretization of this integral. Okay, so how will you do it? Well, the typical way of discretizing the integral is I'm going to write d tau equals to delta, and then I'm going to divide the time into this chunk of zero delta, one delta, two delta, three delta, and so on. Right, and uh, and because you have x of tau here, so that will get replaced with x of k delta. Oh, there is no hat here because this is h. Okay, so the h would get trans transformed by h of t minus k delta and then delta summation, k equals to minus infinity plus infinity. Okay, that's the discretization of this integral. And if you look at this summation, if you look at this summation, it's exactly the same except for this h is replaced with h hat delta. And there isn't much difference between h t minus k delta and h hat delta of t minus k delta because these both are impulse responses and assuming that the impulse response is going to be continuous the two values are going to be very very close to each other so that green arrow is stating that the h parentheses t minus k delta times delta is equal to h delta hat uh, times delta there's also times a here so it's h delta hat times that okay oh, right i see what you're saying then. yeah i just need to know what to underline on my notes Okay, now if you want to do it in a mathematically rigorous way, it requires quite a bit of machinery. Um, so, uh, which which certainly you you ha you you haven't taken some of those courses to make this uh, mathematically precise. Because many a times when you are doing such approximations, it's very important to make sure that some of this area under the curve is not adding up to infinity. You see this this area that we have kind of ignored in our discretization. So when you're doing it in a mathematically precise way, then you have to make sure that those area doesn't add up to infinity because otherwise your answers will be off by a huge margin. And therefore it's not a good approximation. So, but we can't do that mathematical precision in this particular class, but know that uh, people have done this back in 1800s and 1900s. So this is pretty standard. Um, uh, but if you want to understand the complete proof of how this approximation came, uh, you will have to take many advanced mathematics classes um, to make the connection precise so that all the errors are much smaller than the quantities involved. That's the key key issue in such approximations are, but but they can be handled. It's not really that difficult. Okay. So if there are no further questions, uh, what I'm going to do next is we'll talk about properties of convolution. So I'll move on to lecture seven. And in particular, I'm going to talk about three properties Associative property of convolution, commutative, and the third is distributive.
actually i want to talk about commutative and distributive first and then i'm going to talk about associative property it doesn't matter in which sequence we talk about it but it things become much easier if we talk about commutative first okay So let's look at my x convolution h of t given by, I'm going to do it in continuous time, but the discrete time case is similar. So I'll let you guys think about the discrete time case later on. Okay, so I have x of tau, h of t minus tau d tau. Now I'm going to do a change of variable. So I'm going to define Sorry, is that x of tau or x of t in there? X of tau. This is, Thank this you. is t, this is this is tau. Yeah. So the change of variable is I want to write t minus tau as I need a new variable for integration u okay let me use u for integration no u is step function u is already used i need a tau prime okay let me use tau prime okay tau prime is good uh, so t minus tau equals to tau prime so i have tau equals to t minus tau prime and i have d tau equals to minus d tau prime okay So now let's do the integral with this change of variables in place. So when t when tau equals to minus infinity, what is tau prime? So when tau equals to minus infinity, my tau prime plus infinity. Yeah, tau prime equals to plus infinity. When tau equals to infinity, then my tau prime equals to minus infinity, right? That's obvious from this expression. So my limits of integral will change from infinity to minus infinity of x t minus tau prime, h of tau prime minus d tau prime. Any question on this change of variable formula? Um, what value or, or not value, but what, what purpose uh, do we use this for in our, uh, say in, our, in a job that we would be doing? Yeah, so we'll get to it in a bit. So I'm going to talk about commutative property, right? So we'll show that actually the convolution commutes. Okay. Okay, so X cross H is the same as H cross X. That's what we are proving. That's the meaning of commutative property. So commutative means A applied to B is the same as B applied to A. Okay, so now we have this negative sign and I have this limit going from plus, in, plus infinity to minus infinity. So I could change the I could revert the limits of the integration, but with a negative sign, x t minus tau prime, h of tau prime minus t tau prime. And so I have a negative sign here. I have a negative sign in front. I can cancel these two negative signs. And what I get is x of h of tau prime x of t minus tau prime d tau prime which is the same as h convolution x of t
So these two quantities are exactly equal. And that's called commutative property. Okay, so it doesn't matter in which order you are uh, taking the convolution, you are going to get the same result because of the fact that uh, it's merely a change of variable that you are doing. Okay, so this is a this is a special case where the convolution is commutative. Um, there are of course situations like operations in mathematics where things are not commutative. So if I if I can remind you a non-commutative operation. is matrix multiplication. Multiplication. So in general, if you have two matrices AB, AB is not necessarily equal to BA. Okay, so that's just the property of matrices. Um, but in this case, in the case of uh, in the case of convolution, convolution is a commutative operation, but matrix multiplication is not. So, so it's not necessary that most operations would, would have the commutative property, but in this case, we have that property. Okay, any question on the commutative property? Okay, the next is distributive property. So let's say I have this operation. So I take the impulse response of two separate uh, systems and I'm going to commute it with X. So this is the output of a system that looks like this. So I have two systems, one and two. Each of them are LTI systems. And so their impulse response is H1T and H2 of T. And I'm giving the same input to both the systems and I'm going to add their outputs. So let's look at what this uh, distributive property is. What does it mean? X of tau h1 of t minus tau plus h2 of t minus tau d tau. Okay, so we have this, we started with this integral, um, x tau, and in the bracket, we have H, h1 plus h2. We have h1 plus h2. Now, I could open the bracket, and then x tau gets multiplied to each of these things. So I have x tau multiplied by h1, and then x tau multiplied by h2, and I add it up. Now, what do we know about 
integral of sum of functions. What is this equal to? We can split that into two integrals. Right. Um, negative infinity to infinity of x of tau h1 and plus the second one. Right, that's right, that's right. Oh, this should be tau. Okay, and now it's easy to recognize that this is actually x convolution h1 of t and the other one is x convolution h2 of t. So these two things are equal. And this is known as distributive property of convolution. So sum of convolution of sum is, is sum of convolution. Any questions? You can also do this in the other way, which is if you have x1 plus x2 convolution h of t, then it is the same as x1 convolution h of t plus x2 convolution h of t. x1, x2, yt. So you have an LTI system, you have two inputs, both of them gets added, and then you get the output. It's the same as um, you, you give the system with input x1, you give the system input x2, and you add the two outputs. So this diagram is the same as x1 system so the two diagrams are exactly the same Okay, any questions? Let's move on to the third property we wanted to talk about, which is associative property. And in this property, I'm just going to write down the property, but the uh, the integral is going to be like what we did in the previous two, two cases in the commutative and distributive property. We use the properties of integral to derive the commutative and distributive property. Uh, you can do the same thing for associative property, but the integral expression is quite complicated. So I'm not going to write the integral expression, but what this says is Let's say I have two systems and I convolve their impulse response, H1 cross H2, and then I uh, convolve it with X. This is the same as if I convolve the system uh, input to the first system and then convolve it to the second system 
impulse response. So the two, two quantities are exactly equal. This is known as the associative property of convolution. And what this is saying is, suppose I have an input X to system one, system two, output Y, it's the same as system one, system two, output Y. So let me draw So the output of this composite of two system is actually H1 cross H2. And the output coming up from X inputting to system one is actually X cross H1 and that is getting fed into system two. And the output you're going to get from any of these two operations is going to be the same. That is the associative property. Remember that this convolution equation holds only for the LTI system, which means that if the input is X and the impulse response is H, then the output is X convolution with H. And uh, so, so all LTI systems, if you're sort of composing LTI systems and so on, uh, you will get an LTI system because of these properties. Okay. Any questions on the properties of convolution? We talked about three different properties of convolution, commutative, distributive, and associative property. And they have uh, quite a lot of applications within the systems community uh, because of the fact that be, within the LTI systems community. So if, if it was a nonlinear system or if it was not a time invariant system, things are very different. But because we are looking into the LTI domain, these three properties are extremely important for uh, simplifying our life uh, in the in order to compute what the response of the system is going to be with respect to complex inputs. Okay, now let's talk about properties of LTI systems. So remember we had talked about properties of there were six properties of systems, linear and time invariant being two such properties, and there were four others. So memoryless system, invertible systems, causal, stable. Okay, so remember in the memoryless system, y of t must be some function of x of t, right? Where f is some function. Now, if that, so within the LTI system, this function f has to be a linear function because only then it can satisfy all the uh, linear linearity property. So it turns out that in a memoryless LTI system, Y 
my y of t is just going to be some scaling k of x of t because this function f has to be linear in a memoryless lti system so therefore you are only going to amplify the input or you are going to um, reduce the amplitude of the input but you are not going to change the input fundamentally okay so something like a step up or step down transformer does exactly this this thing step up transformer or a step down transformer or a dc motor okay so in a dc motor the input is a current so x of t is current and the output is the rotational speed and uh, there is a linear relationship between the current and the motor speed or the number of revolutions per minute coming out of the motor okay so those are memoryless lti system let's look at invertible lti system So remember that in invertible system, we have the input x t. We can pass the output of x of t. Uh, sorry, we can pass the output of the system to an inverse system to get x of t back. Okay, so x of t can be recovered from looking at y of t. So that's an invertible system. So by a simple analogy, I can give it an input delta t. My output is h of t. I have this inverse system, and I would like to recover delta t. So we would like the inverse system, the impulse response of the inverse system Let's say it's h one of t. So we would like my h of t or h convolution h one of t to be equal to delta t. Okay, so so remember the system's output h of t is going into this inverse system as input. So the output of inverse system is going to be h of t convolution with h one of t. And so we would like it to be equal to delta t. Only then the system is invertible. So merely by looking at the impulse response of the system of the LTI system, and being able to construct an inverse impulse response, sorry, an impulse response of the inverse system, if you can find such an h1 such that h cross h1 is equal to delta t, then the system is invertible as a whole. So no matter what input you give to the system, by looking at the output, you can reconstruct the input. Let's look at an example of any any question so far on invertible LTI system before I jump on to the example. So let's look at an example. Let's say I have a system where H of T is delta T minus T naught. 
So basically you give it an impulse input and you get the impulse output, but translated in time. So there is some delay and after that some impulse comes out of it. I'm trying to think of an example when such a thing would happen. Well, let's say you have a, you have, so one way to dis measure the distance between earth and moon is to send a laser light to, well, laser has to be a different color. So you send a laser light to moon, the laser gets reflected back to earth and you measure the, uh, how much time it took for the, for the information to go to the moon and come back. Okay, so there is going to be a delay between when you send the pulse of the laser and when you receive it back. And that basically allows you to compute the distance between earth and moon. Um, actually, there was a big bang theory episode where these nerdy guys were doing this experiment. I don't know any one of you see big bang theory or not. Okay, so, so that's the, that's the situation where you get the impulse output, but after a certain point of time, this T naught is the delay. So that's the kind of system we are looking at. Now the question is, can I construct an H1 of T such that H convolution H1 of T is going to be delta T? So can I have delta T minus T naught convolution H1 of T equals to delta T? So what kind of H1 of T can I pick? What do you think? Any thoughts? What sort of H1 T can I construct so that the convolution with delta T minus T naught is going to give me delta T? Could you add T naught inside of the H1 yeah. of T? Yeah, that's the answer. So if I convolve it with delta T plus T naught, so remember this system basically translated the output, uh, the input by T naught amount. So I'm going to just translate it back by T naught amount. So I just added T plus T naught, and this is exactly equal to delta T. How do we know that the uh, that distinct inputs would lead to distinct outputs, though? I guess that's what I'm confused. Oh, so when right. So if you can look at the output and you can reconstruct the input, that means that distinct input would give you distinct output. Because if two inputs give you the same output, then there is no way for you to distinguish between what the input was, right? So it's the same same idea here as well. Okay. Does that make sense? So with X1 of T, I get Y1 of T. If X2 of T, with I get Y2 of T. And I should be able to say by looking at, if my output is Y1 of T, I should be able to say that, oh, the input was X1 of T, right? That, that's the same thing. So the two, two definitions are equivalent. Distinct input gives distinct output is the same as saying that if I pass XT through a system, I get YT. I pass it through an inverse system, I should be able to get XT back. The two definitions are exactly the same. Okay. Yeah. And for the LTI system, because all of this can be done through convolution, the criteria for figuring out whether a system, whether an LTI system is invertible or not, basically boils down to construction of such an H1T such that H convolution H1 is the same as delta function, the impulse function. Great question. Okay. The third property that I'm going to talk about is causal. So the causal systems, if you recall from the definition, are non 
anticipative. Okay, it doesn't anticipate what the input is going to look like. So now let's look at it. I give it an input delta t. So at time t equals to zero, I give the system an impulse input. And the system is causal. What do you think the output is going to look like? So this is time zero, y of t. Okay, so the output, so let's look at it this way. So let's look at time t less than zero. So for time, for all time t less than zero, which means from time going from minus infinity all the way to zero, the input was actually zero and we have an LTI system here. So if the input is zero, what is the output going to be for this causal system? Okay, so if my input, so x of t equals to zero for all t less than zero, this implies that my y of t will be equal to zero for all t less than zero. And that's because in the LTI system, zero input will give you zero output because of the homogeneity property of the linear system. So if I'm giving zero input all the way up to time zero, I should be getting a zero output all the way up to time zero. And so this implies, this property automatically implies that if I give delta T as input, then H of T must be equal to zero for all T less than zero. And that's the property of a causal LTI system. So a causal LTI system, the impulse response must be uh, negative, must be zero all the way up to time zero. So a cool exam question would be, suppose my H of T for a LTI system, if it looks like E raised to minus T, T less than zero, E raised to T, E raised to minus, well, E raised to T, T less than zero, and E raised to minus T, T greater than zero. If this is the impulse response, is this a causal system? And the answer is no, not causal. It's not causal because for T less than zero, I have a non-zero value of the impulse response and therefore it's not a causal system. Okay, any question so far? It's not causal because when t is less than zero, e to the t is not less than zero? No, it's not equal to zero. So remember, equal h of zero. t has to be zero. Yeah. Okay. h of t should be equal to zero for all t less than zero. This is the key property. Okay. Let's move on to the final property, which is stability. Okay. So let's look at it. The the definition of stability was, this is a slightly more complicated concept. So the definition of stability was bounded input gives bounded output. Okay, so let's look at it this way. 
my xt is the input and my xt is bounded by capital b less than equal to capital b now what is my yt going to look like it's integral of x tau h of t minus tau d tau and this goes from minus infinity to plus infinity and i want to show that my output is going to be bounded so if i want to show that my output is bounded i have to take the absolute value of yt which is absolute value of this integral h of t minus tau d tau absolute value what's the absolute value of integral what sort of inequality do we know about for absolute value of integral any thoughts well it's less than equal to the integral of absolute value x tau absolute value of h t minus tau d tau now i know that my x of tau is bounded from above by b so i am just left with the absolute value of h of t minus tau d tau so when is the output going to be bounded any thoughts when would the output be bounded when is yt less than infinity well in order for that to happen i want my this quantity must be bounded okay so my integral of h of t minus tau d tau absolute value of h of t minus tau d tau this must be bounded and actually this gives us a sufficient condition but actually it's also necessary i can construct inputs okay wait just just let it be for now so what we can show what we have shown here that if integral minus infinity to infinity h of tau d tau is bounded then the system is stable this is what we have showed above that if i can if the absolute value of the integral of the impulse response absolute value of the impulse response is bounded then the system is stable in fact it goes the other way also so this probably would be an exercise so system is stable if no if the system is stable then integral of h tau absolute value d tau is bounded i'll try to give a assignment question on this example or oh, sorry in the, of this for this exercise so you can see for yourself that uh this becomes both the necessary and sufficient condition for stability for lti system so the impulse response must be integrable and only then the system is stable okay that's all i wanted to cover today i'm going to uh turn off the recording and i'll stick around if you have any questions feel free to ask now